Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Paul Jeanette. And I'm Pastor Teresa. And we're here to welcome you to another wonderful day that the Lord has made at St. Paul's United Methodist Church. There's a lot going on in the life of the church as usual. And as we're going through the announcements, please sign in on those red friendship pads and pass them down the pew and then sneak a peek if you need to at the names of the people nearby. Wonderful. Again, we want to just say a wonderful welcome to Emily. We've been delighted to have Emily with us and working with the choir during this interim time. Um, and we also today get to welcome John White with us and say a huge thank you to John for stepping hey. in to help us out in this interim time. We are really blessed with people saying yes when, when we ask them to help out, and that was a wonderful joy. And now I'm going to invite Catherine Mapes to come down for a minute. There she is right here. I wanted to say a quick word about the... Um, surveys that she's handing out among you today. Okay, I'm Catherine Mapes and I belong to the WIM group and that group and the readers group in the church are the only two women's groups we have which is very unusual. In the past the Methodist Church really had quite a few uh, people involved. So what we've done is to make up a survey to find out what all the women in the church are interested in doing and hoping that maybe uh, you might be willing to join our group and we're thinking actually maybe of just meeting, you know, four times a year or six times a year, cutting down the number of times and, you know, having fun activities and also getting involved in things like making uh, kids, etc. So if you could fill this out, it would really help us a lot in knowing uh, what you're interested in. Thank you. Okay, and there's a lot of important stuff going on as usual in life of the church. Today, there are two important things I'd like to call your attention to. First is that we're going to have a celebration of life for Betty Metheny um, this, uh, today at, at noon, actually in the Durham room, and all are invited to that. Then this afternoon, the area congregations together, Thanksgiving service is going to be across the street at the Temple Bethel. And then coming up this week, there's going to be a free movie screening at Cinemopolis on... Um, November 27th, which I think is Wednesday? No. Yeah, it's coming right up. No, that's, that's week after next. I'm sorry. Not, that's week after next. Sorry. And, <laughs> and getting ahead of myself. And then on Saturday, uh, December 1st, is uh, the fundraiser uh, that you can read more about in your announcements. Wonderful. Thank you. The Giving Tree is up. The youth have done an awesome job putting that together, and that's out there. So please make sure to take some tags so we can give generously during this holiday season. Our, our annual church conference is coming up on December 2nd. Um, we're going to be in Auburn, New York. So we're going to drive up the side of the lake, a lovely drive up there together. And then we'll be starting around 3.15-ish up there, um, joining together with other churches in our district. So we get a chance to meet and greet some other churches, do some worship time together, and then have our church conference and return. One of the ways it's happening is that all of the wonderful ordained clergy of our district are running some of these church conferences. So I am going to be leaving immediately after the service, I'm so sorry, and running up to the Great Lake, up the side of the lake, um, to run church conferences. So I apologize that I won't be here long, but that's what I'm going to be doing so that other churches can come together today and have their church conferences. I also wanted to point out that um, with Thanksgiving this week, we obviously don't have my study time in the evening on Thursday, but we're going to be back in full swing the following week, and we're going to be doing an Advent series called Simply Wait. And so we're going to be spending some time in contemplative, thoughtful discernment and conversation as we practice a little waiting in a season that doesn't give us a lot of time to wait. And those, I think, are the announcements that I have today. Okay, then if there's nothing else, then please rise as you're able and greet your neighbors in Christian fellowship and then be seated for the introduction.
as you move your way back to your seat, I'm going to invite us to do something we don't often get to do very often in our lives. We're going to take really deep cleansing breath and hold it for a moment. And then we're going to spend some time in silence while the bells surround us. So let's first try that big deep breath. Are you ready? Inhale. And I invite you to do that a few times during this time of prayer and music, just to let the air come in and hold in your lungs. And then as you let it out, let out some of the stress of life and just center yourself on the spirit that surrounds us. Let us be in prayer. Today we move from the book of Ruth into the book of 1 Samuel. And the first time I encountered the book of 1 Samuel, Charles Dickens came to mind. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Though unfortunately for our reading today, I think they are feeling a lot like they're spending time in those worst of times. <clears throat> they were, Israel was feeling politically weak, economically disadvantaged in immoral chaos. Violence came at them from the outside and from within. So they began to pray and yearn for someone to unite them, for God to provide an anointed one that would bring them together as a full nation. They waited and they prayed and they yearned and God acted. And from a barren second wife named Hannah, new life arose. So let us rise if we're comfortable and able to do so as we join together in our call to worship. 
come, let us use our voices to praise the Lord. Let us use our minds to ponder the wondrous deeds of God. With all of our strength and being, let us worship the Lord of love. And now let us sing together number 168 in the red hymnal at the name of Jesus. be seated. And I invite you to join your voice with mine in prayer. We call on your name, O God, for you have offered us the cup of salvation and welcomed us into your family. How can we thank you for the love you have shown us in Jesus Christ? Meet us again in this hour that we may grow in faith and be responsive to your truth. Fill us with hope, renewing our confidence to face life in faithful trust and obedience. Amen. Our Bible reading this morning is from the book of 1 Samuel. I'm reading from the message and it's printed in your bulletin to follow along. Elkanah had two wives. The first was Hannah, the second was Penina. Penina had children, Hannah did not. Every year, Elkanah went from his hometown up to Shiloh to worship and offer a sacrifice to God of the angel armies. Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, served as the priests of God there. 
When Elkanah sacrificed, he passed helpings from the sacrificial meal around to his wife Penina and all her children. But he always gave an extra generous helping to Hannah because he loved her so much and because God had not given her children. But her rival wife taunted her cruelly, rubbing it in and never letting her forget that God had not given her children. This went on year after year. Every time she went to the sanctuary of God, she could expect to be taunted. Hannah was ruled to tears and had no appetite. Her husband Alcana said, Oh, Hannah, why are you crying? Why aren't you eating? Why are you so upset? Am I not of more worth to you than ten sons? So Hannah ate. Then she pulled herself together, slipped away quietly, and entered the sanctuary. The priest Eli was on duty at the entrance to God's temple in the customary seat. Crushed in soul, Hannah prayed to God and cried and cried inconsolably. Then she made a vow. O God of the angel armies, if you'll take a good hard look at my pain, if you'll quit neglecting me and go into action for me by giving me a son, I'll give him completely, unreservedly to you. I'll set him apart for a life of holy discipline. It so happened that as she continued in prayer before God, Eli was watching her closely. Hannah was praying in her heart silently. Her lips moved, but no sound was heard. Eli jumped to the conclusion that she was drunk. He approached her and said, you're drunk. How long do you plan to keep this up? Sober up, woman. Hannah said, oh no, sir, please. I'm a woman hard used. I haven't been drinking, not a drop of wine or beer. The only thing I've been pouring out is my heart, pouring it out to God. Don't for a minute think I'm a bad woman. It's because I'm so desperately unhappy and in such pain that I've stayed here so long. Eli answered her, go in peace, and may the God of Israel give you what you have asked of him. Think well of me and pray for me, she said, and went her way. Then she ate heartily, her face radiant. Up before dawn, they worshiped God and returned home to Ramah. Elkanah slept with Hannah, his wife, and God became, began making the necessary arrangements in response to what she had asked. Before the year was out, Hannah had conceived and given birth to a son. She named him Samuel, which means God has heard, explaining, I asked God for him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
Don't go anywhere, guys. Stay right here. Come join me for a minute. And any other children want to come join us, come on down. Come on down. Can't sit on me, next to me. Okay, I know, it's terrible. Not on me, next to me. Everybody coming? I have a test. I have a test. Are you ready for a test? Shh. <laughs> he knows the test. He knows the test. That's what we're going to do. We're going to see if we're going to look at emojis and see if we can guess what they're feeling. Are you ready? You ready? Happy. Happy. Sad. 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 Scared. Scared. And our last one for a moment is angry. 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 There are more in there. We're going to look There's at them in just a minute. Next yeah. Shh, shh, shh. Don't peek. No peeking ahead. No, no peeking ahead. The next one's excited. You're right. Because in our story that we just heard read, our nice long story about Hannah, Hannah goes through a whole bunch of emotions in our story. And she starts out in our story feeling very sad. Yeah. In fact, it's not only that she's sad, she is feeling, i got to find the right one here. There they are. She's feeling super sad, right? Really sad. She's crying and crying and crying. But then, by the end of the story, she's feeling happy. In fact, not just happy, excited and joyful, right? Yeah. And in the whole story and everything that goes on in her life, from her sad to her happy to her overjoyed, she is always talking to God about how she's feeling. She tells God when she's feeling so sad that she's just crying and unhappy. She tells God when she's feeling happy and excited at the end. She just keeps talking to God about how she's feeling all the way through the story. And that's a great reminder for us that when we're going through all these lovely emotions, we can tell God about them. So what we, our prayer today, we're going to practice praying to God about all our emotions. Are you ready? You ready? You're going to repeat after me. God of love. Be with me when I'm happy. Be with me when I'm happy. Be with me when I'm sad. Be with me when I'm sad. Be with me when I'm scared. Be with me when I'm scared. And be with me when I'm angry. Be with me when I'm angry. And remind me that you're always with me. Remind me that you're always with me. Amen. Great job, guys. Thanks so much. You passed the test. <laughs> You did! Flying colors!
Thank you, choir. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, John. Music just lifts the soul, doesn't it? Let us pray. God of grace, lift our souls. Fill us with your presence. Fill us with your word. Fill us with your gratitude. Amen. Shiloh, the great worship center of Shiloh. It was the center of all worship for the people of Israel, even during the time of the judges. It was the place everyone went to worship before Jerusalem and the great temple was built, Shiloh. Oh, to have seen it in its glory. The 12 tribes return from their slavery in Egypt. They go through the wilderness for 40 years, and in that time, they build this tabernacle, this tent of worship, and in it dwells the covenant of God, the Ark of the Covenant. And once they cross the Jordan and they begin settling into the land, into their tribal areas, they set up this tent at Shiloh. That is where all worship was centered. That's where their identity was centered. People traveled there and they worshiped and they brought their offerings and their sacrifices. And there was the noise of the congregation, the people coming and going. And there was the singing and the music and the laughter and the joy. There was vitality and there was life. And then we get to the end of the book of Judges and the beginning of 1 Samuel suddenly begin to change in this image of Shiloh. If we were to skip ahead just a little bit and get to chapter 3 of Samuel, verse 1 tells us a startling revelation about Shiloh in these days. It says, the word of the Lord was rare in those days, and the visions from God were scarce. That's not how you want to describe a center of worship. The word of the Lord was rare, and the visions of God were scarce. And then the third verse says, And the eternal flame of God before the altar of the Lord was going out. Whew, that's not a good picture of Shiloh. And then it goes on to tell us that Eli, the great high priest, was losing his sight. And in the Bible, that is always more than just losing your eyesight. Just before all that startling revelation, it shall tells us about Eli's sons who are next in line to become the high priests and that they are beyond greedy, beyond corrupt, and are actively violating the purity of Israel by abusing their power. Shiloh was dying. It was barren. And it was despairing. The stories of 1 Samuel are written so brilliantly. As the book opens, we are drawn into the story of this woman, Hannah, and her husband, Elkanah, and the other wife, and Eli. However, as we finally get to the point where Samuel is born and we begin to move deeper into this story that is named after this baby, Samuel, we begin to realize that the story of Hannah is about so much more than this wonderful woman and her family, that Hannah and her story are also the narrative of Israel at that time. Israel at that time is going through this great transition between being a tribal connection into a kingdom, into a united nation. And so Hannah's story becomes a story of that great transition for Israel. But it also becomes a story of all of God's people who find themselves going through those monumental transitions from seeming death into new life. In the beginning of the story, Hannah is barren and despairing. She sees little hope for her future. She is weeping constantly, refusing to eat, and not getting exactly helpful support from her family. That is the embodiment of what Israel is going through at the close of the book of Judges and in the close of the season of the Judges. They're in constant violence and danger from enemy nations around their per perimeter and from their own tribal division inside. They are deeply afraid of each other, distrustful of each other, divided of different opinions about things and not getting along in any way, shape, or form. 
They no longer are seeking Shiloh and the worship center for their advice and for their centering of their faith and for their sustenance and for their nourishment. Like we mentioned when we were studying Ruth the last two weeks, in those days, everyone did what was right in their own eyes and didn't consult anyone else. Certainly not religion, certainly not Shiloh, and certainly not Eli's sons. Israel is barren and despairing. It sees little hope in its future. It throws its hands in the air and it goes, what can we do? What hope is there for us? This story is also the story, unfortunately, of the church across the centuries and the church in our time. Not just the United Methodist Church, but the Lutheran Church and the Presbyterian Church and the Baptist Church and the Roman Catholic Church, and we could go on and name all these denominations and even the seemingly thriving megachurches. They all can reminisce about those golden days. You remember those golden days when the pews were full and the ministries were overflowing from every room in the building when the generosity funded and fueled things beyond our wildest dreams, the golden days. But now, so many churches across our country are bemoaning low attendance. They are struggling to get enough people to serve in ministries and missions and committees and teams. Hint, hint. Little plug there. So many churches are struggling with their budgets being in the negative and wrestling with how they're going to make ends meet. It becomes a recurring theme when the clergy get together in the United Methodist Church, when the clergy get together across ecumenical lines and even interfaith groups gathering together. We still have excellent leaders, beautiful leaders, but the message that the world receives about the church doesn't make a lot of people want to run for our doors. They see visions of the capital C church condoning racism and other horrible isms in our world. They see the headlines about priests abusing their parishioners. They see rejection of the LGBTQ community by what should be a welcoming faith. The image of the world sees that the church sometimes looks too much like Eli's sons. And it leaves the leaders in the church feeling frustrated and despairing, worrying about what the future might hold. People are so busy, schedules are so full, the church as a priority seems to be sliding down the list. What can we do? But then there's Hannah. In a culture of ancient Israel where she, shouldn't have, she should have had nothing that she could have done to address her barrenness and despair. She has no status, she has no rights, she has no recourse. She should be throwing her hands in the air and saying, what can I do? But instead, she pulls herself together and she acts. She goes all by herself, completely on her own, into the house of worship, despite its flickering flame. And she prays all that is going on within her. And though the normal practice of prayer at that time was to stand and to speak your prayers aloud in the space, she tries something new, a new form of worship in an ancient space, rooted in her faith, but expressed in a new way. She prays silently, believing that God can hear what goes on in the heart just as well as God can hear what comes out of her lips. When Eli gets in her way, and that should have been our first hint that something's wrong at Shiloh. When Eli looks at a woman praying and thinks she's drunk, what's going on in Shiloh? That that's his first response. When Eli gets in her way, she has the audacity to stand up to the high priest of Israel and defend herself and to put things right. It could have been a disaster for her. She could have failed miserably. But she took the risk, and in return, she is blessed. After centering in worship and praying for her future, Hannah goes out into the world, and she lives in certain hope. She stops her weeping. She eats and drinks and cares for herself, because she is living in a trust that new life will be possible through the God who is now walking 
with her, who'd been walking with her all along, but now she sees. Her new life with God doesn't look like what other new lives look like in her culture. Her motherhood will take on a different flavor as she takes that beloved son, Samuel, and returns him to the temple, to Shiloh, so that he can bring new life to her faith, new life to her people, so that he can anoint the future. What can we take from Hannah's story? What does God say to us through Hannah's strength and her initiative and her courage and her deep and abiding faith? First, God says, pray for your church. Pray for the church. Pray for all churches across our world. Pray for our community of Christ wherever it may be found. And pray hard. Pour your heart and soul into it. Stand up boldly. Proclaim what God teaches us. Don't let the media be the only word people hear about the church. And don't let people silence what we have to say. We can embrace new ways. We can dream new dreams that are rooted deeply in who we have always been and who God created us to be. We can risk failing disastrously and persevere. And we can live and we can worship and we can learn and we can give in the hope of the new life that God envisions for this church, for the District of the Finger Lakes, for Upper New York, and across the nation and the world. Our God is the God of new life, the God of abundant life, the God of resurrection life. We are not Shiloh, but there is much we can learn from her. We can speak the word of God often. We can reach out and grasp the dreams of God and open ourselves to the visions of the future and shine brightly with the light of God. And we can listen to the voice of Hannah among us, hear her prayer, grasp new ideas, attend to the needs until we are living into the new life that God seeks to bless us with always. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of response is a new one, number 505, and it's not a red hymnal, it's a dark colored hymnal. When our confidence is shaken.
did. Many of you know that we have sent our wonderful um, George Gall and Nancy Potter down to Costa Rica where they are working diligently with the Aqua Viva surveys. And now we have some other church members who are about to make the journey and go down and be with them and join them in this wonderful, wonderful ministry. I am so sorry that I didn't get a chance to bless George and Nancy before they headed off down to Costa Rica. And if they're joining us by live stream, hi, George and Nancy. And now I would like to invite our new missionaries about to go down to come join me. And Pastor Debbie's going to join me. And we're going to offer a blessing to George and Nancy and to our wonderful missionaries heading out. Um, and also invite you to be, um, bring in some toothbrushes that we can send with them as they head out um, to go down and be able to encourage some of the things that the dentists are teaching um, the wonderful people of Costa Rica and to be able to show our support for the ministries that they are involved in. They are putting together clean water for many, many people and doing so much more. Come on down, missionaries. Come join me. We're doing one set this week and one set next week. Next Sunday, probably pretty early in the morning, Paul and Barbara are going to be heading out. Come right up here and join me so everybody can see you and turn and face your wonderful church family. They're going to be heading out, heading down to Costa Rica. They're going to spend how many days? Five working and five. Five exploring. <laughs> nice. Five. So about ten days down in Costa Rica, putting on their summer clothing and getting hard to work. And so we want to make sure we send them with our blessing. And so as we bless them, it's the whole congregation that blesses them, not just Pastor Debbie and I. So we're all going to raise our hands in blessings toward our wonderful Paul and Barbara as they prepare to go out. As I offer these words of prayer, let us bless them. Sending God, we have heard your call through Jesus to give food to the hungry, to provide clean water to the thirsty, to spend time with the sick and imprisoned, to clothe the naked and to welcome the stranger. Help us to answer this call in a myriad of ways. Today, Paul and Barbara stand before us ready to answer that call. George and Nancy have gone before them at work even now to embody Matthew chapter 25. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon them. Strengthen them for this work. Fill them with compassion. Let your love flow through them. May the witness of their mission light a fire within all of us to do the same. Here in Ithaca and around the world, and all of God's people gathered in this place said together in one voice, Amen. Thank you. God's blessing on your travels and in all you experience, and come back and tell us fabulous stories. Thank you so much. Lord, in your mercy, faithful God, we confess that we like to live in a predictable world where we know what to expect and have the illusion of control over what happens. But again and again, you surprise us with unexpected encounters, joys and sorrows, and a blanket of snow when winter still seemed a distant reality. Help us to have faith in your grace and loving presence that meets us where we are and en enables us as individuals and as the people of God to endure in difficult times. Hear our cries when we, like Hannah, pour out our concerns to you and make our faces radiant, O oh God, as we walk in faith with you and trust that you will provide for us in ways we cannot imagine. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Loving God, we ask your blessing on the work of providing access to clean water that Nancy and George are doing in Costa Rica and that Paul, Barbara, and David will soon join them in doing. We pray for all who suffer from lack of food, clean water, medical care, and education. 
O oh God, we are especially mindful of refugees who are fleeing violence in their countries and seeking a better life for their families. Our prayers go out to Central American migrants as they journey toward our southern border and to those who are experiencing severe malnutrition and daily threats to life in Yemen and Syria. We hold the people of California in our hearts as they deal with terrible loss of life and property from fires that sweep through whole cities, burning everything in their path. Comfort those whose loved ones are missing and sustain them as they search for answers. Lord, in your mercy. <laughs> Compassionate God, Today we lift up those in need from within our congregation as well as those connected to us through family and friendship, especially Bob, Mary and Matthew, Raymond and his family, Laverne, Priscilla, Cheryl, Steve, Mark, David, Jackie, Larry, Carl and Sujata, Kathleen, Vera, Walter, and Lee. Be with each person named, we pray, and with all those unnamed who are close to our hearts. O oh God, we pray for those in our country who live with violence caused by racial, sexual, and ethnic prejudice. As we prepare to celebrate Transgender Day of Remembrance on November 20th, we are especially mindful of our transgendered brothers and sisters, many of whom have been murdered in past years by those who are filled with hatred and intolerance. We take a moment of silence now as we hold in love and prayer transgendered people around the world who are suffering from discrimination. Guide us, we pray, to stand in solidarity with transgendered people and to be strong advocates, especially within the United Methodist Church, for persons of all sexual orientations and gender identifications. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Merciful God, we pray for our government and its leaders, especially our president and members of Congress on both sides of the political spectrum, that they will strive to cooperate for the sake of the greater good. We lift up all who participate in the body of Christ and pray that your church will bring a message of peace, love, and healing to the world. Help us to understand and respect differences between religions and within the Christian faith that we may learn from each other and grow in unity through acceptance of our diversity. O oh God, we pray for the United Methodist Church, for St. Paul's, for Pastor Teresa, and for all the delegates to the special session of General Conference in February. You have commanded us to love you with all our hearts, minds, and souls, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Fill us now and in the months ahead with your love and ground us in the words Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hannah serves as a model for all God's people and for us, the church. She seeks God, speaks of her needs before God, and stands up for herself before those who would silence her. She believes in God's action in the world. 
Hannah is absolutely faithful in her relationship with God, in trusting into God's care her child and her life. Let us follow Hannah's example and give of ourselves to God. Let us give not only of our resources, let us give all that we are to God.
Let us pray. We are a thankful people, God our Maker. As a sign of our gratitude, we offer these gifts and our very selves. Bless it all, God. Bless these resources as they go forth. Bless us to be your hands and feet in the world. May all our lives be a song of thanksgiving to you. Amen. And now let us sing together our final hymn, number 694, Come Ye Thankful People, Come. a service of music, have we not? We are so grateful to have our bell choir with us and the beautiful music that they have shared with us. We are so grateful to Jessa and Katrina for the beautiful music from our children and Alexa of the company on the guitar and the choir and the organ. Everyone says, Amen. Amen. And now, may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rain or snow fall softly on your field. And until we are gathered together again, may the God of love hold you tenderly in the palm of God's hand. Amen. And now let us close our service as we began it, centering ourselves, breathing deeply of the spirit and hearing the music surround us. Please be seated. <laughs> 